Aloha mai kako. This is Kumu Kawai Kapu Okalani Hiwet, and we are here today to film another program. Ke ao ma lama lama oka hula. This is a program that reflects the many traditions of the hula. Today we have a special program. We have a special interviewer that is Kumu Melia Lobenstein Carter. And we have a special interviewee that is Kavai Kapu Okalani Hiwe. Before we start, Ke Ao Okama Lama Lama Okahula, the enlightenment of the hula through the stories of people who have been involved in hula all of their lives, I would like to thank the administration and the staff here at Windward Community College for all of their help and support in making this series of hula programs possible. I would also like to thank the Dolores Martin Foundation for their contributions in helping to make all of this possible. That being said, without further ado, let's begin Ke Ao Okama Lama Lama Okahula, the enlightenment, the glow, the respect, the honor, the nurturing of our hula tradition here in Hawaii. Kumuhula Melia Lobenstein Carter. Aloha mai kako. I'm so excited and so honored to be asked to do this because as this program has progressed, we were all wondering when is Kawai Kapu Kalani going to be interviewed? And ayala, here we are. This is the day. This is the day. It's just so <clears throat> my kai. And there's so much that, that creates this phenomenon that you are and hopefully in this time we get to know a little bit more about you and so knowing who you are um, and how you feel about where you come from could you enlighten us like a little bit about your mo'okuauhau, where you are from, where your ohana is from, how you were raised, who raised you, the beautiful people that helped create who you are today. Mahalo. First, I want to acknowledge my grandparents that helped to raise me. We were raised here in Kaneohe on Haiku Road, Ahupua'a of Heeia. My grandmother, Eva Wahinia Li'i Rowan Kana'e, her family comes from Heeia. My grandfather, Frank Ka'ai Ali'i Oliloa Kana'e, it was in their home that we were raised on Haiku Road, along with all of my brothers and sisters, and my father, Alexander Kapili Aloha Hewitt, who is part of the Keave Mauhili family. They are from Wailua on the island of Oahu. And my mother, Alice Puoleilani Kanae. Now, life was tough. There was always hula. There was always music, there was always aloha, there was always malama, the nurturing and care, especially that nurturing and care that comes from the ike kupuna, from my grandparents. We didn't have a lot of money. We had land, my grandparents had land, and we had farm animals, we had chickens, we had ducks, we had turkeys, we had pony, we had horse, we had cow, we had pua'a. We had all of these wonderful things. We had to take care of them. This was not easy when you're young and you like go outside and play. Mm -hmm. We had to have a government supplement. So I was raised not with a silver spoon in my mouth. I had to work. And we had to have food stamps. And it was not easy, luckily, because we could live with our grandparents 
we didn't have to go to public housing. I remember vividly in my mind standing in line with my mother doing Christmas at Toys for Tots to make sure all the nine children had Christmas gifts. That taught me the strength and gave me a good foundation of what I was going to do in my future. At age 14, I got my first job. I worked at a mail clerk for the Department of Education in Kaneohe. And I remember, you know, this Ike Kupuna, the guidance of uh, Kupuna. When I got my first paycheck, I thought, whoo, I was rich. Mm. And grandma said to me, okay, now you get one job, you're making money. So she explained to me, you take your first paycheck and you divide it into three parts. One is for you. One, you put in the savings. And one, you got to help the family. And it's that that guided me into my future. She said, your first paycheck, you go buy cake and ice cream, and you treat everybody, <laughs> and we celebrate with pule, with prayer, and we mahalo ke akua, and we mahalo the aumakua, our kupuna of this family. We celebrate, and every time you get paid, you have to do this. Yes. So that kind of enlightenment, that kind of kupuna ike, I followed all of my life. You know, when I think about all the things I've accomplished and the things that I've done, Kupuna was never not connected to everything I did. Everything I did. So age 14, started working at the um, Department of Education, as I said, mail clerk. 16, I got another job. 18, I got another job, always working. Never have not worked to provide a home, housing for my mother, making sure I was able to pay all the bills to help the family as much as I could. I remember I was a marquee setter at the Jerry Lewis Twin Theaters at Windward City. I went to work for the Department of Parks and Recreation to teach hula. Uh, Hawaiian Arts and Crafts, and then I continued uh, to work at so many, many different places. I remember city and county, when you worked with them, you were trained at the Hawaiiana Center yes. uh, up in uh, Waikiki near Kapi'olani Park. And at that time, they sent all of us uh, young employees to, re to learn our hula, and our Hawaiian instruments, and our Hawaiian arts and crafts. Uh, Leolani Pratt, Aina Keave, Aina Gehen, Adeline Lee, George Holokai, and others who were there to teach us, train us in everything we had to know. We were sent back to the parks, the city and county parks, and then we became the teachers. Well, after that, <clears throat> now we're talking about 1972, 1973, 72, I entered Windward Community College as a student, and hell, I did really, really bad. I flunked every course. <laughs> I was not really serious about my studies, but after that first year of seeing all the Fs and knowing the kind of person that my grandparents and my parents had guided me to become, to be a very hard worker, to set goals, to work towards those goals, to achieve those goals. I came back to school the following semester, and from all Fs, I got all As. Wow. And then that continued my journey. I got my associate here in 1975, went to uh, University of Hawaii at Hilo, came back in December of 78, and started working here in January of 1979. So all my life, this journey of family 
and love for our people and our culture through Hakumele composing music, through hula and hula performances, and the many, many entertainers that I had the opportunity to perform with. So, you know, we're talking about gee, the first time I started to dance hula, uh, we were learning hula from Ellen Ferreira here in Kaneohe. And uh, of course, you know, Ahiloa, Uela, Ho'olulu, Kalehuala. That was, gee, 10 years old. Wow. And then, of course, after that, I never stopped dancing, never stopped performing. So talking about hula, let's talk about the facet of you with hula, because that's what everybody, I think, when they think about you, the first thing that comes to mind is you as a kumu hula, as an olapa, and the influences that you had in hula. So you talk about going to parks and recreations and with Ellen Ferreira, but how about in the ohana? Like, what is your earliest memory as a child of hula in your home, uh, from your kupuna, of, of how you kind of, you know, like grandma always said that hula chooses you. So at what point or what is your earliest memory of you being chosen for hula in your ohana? So grandma, Eva Vahinyali'i Rowan Kana'e, came from the He'e'ia Ohana, the Kapa Manu family. And at that time, Kanuku Kapa Manu uh, was a very well known kumuhula of He'e'ia. He was one of the first kumuhula that went to the first World's Fair. He also um, performed for King Kalakaua. And when we had our first family reunion, the story was that when King Kalakaua came to the Ahupua of Heia, the Kanuku Kapamanu, well, the Kapamanu family would perform. And of course, one of the sisters that was Kihei Kapamanu married our great grandpa, or great great grandpa, that was, of course, George Rowan of Heia. So, grandma then had great influence on my life when it came to hula. The, the biggest inspiration, the foundation of all that inspiration, love for mele, mo'o'olelo, and hula came from Grandma Kana'e. Of course, having that inspiration guided me to becoming a student with Auntie Emma de Vries. Auntie Emma de Vries had learned her hula from Keaka Kanahele, and Keaka Kanahele had learned her hula from Kanuku Kapamanu. So it comes back full circle. So I'm learning um, from 1972 until her passing in 1980, hula from Auntie Emma de Vries. And not only hula, but pule, you know, the prayers, um, oli, the chants, the different styles, um, spiritualism, and understanding all of that. So Auntie Emma then became the next important driving force in my learning and understanding of the hula tradition. While Auntie Emma sent me to learn and study from Auntie Iolani Luahine, who was her cousin. After Auntie Emma passed away, she directed me to go and study with Auntie Lani Kalama. And it's from Auntie Lani Kalama that I learned all of my hula pahu. Grandma was a student of Sally Woods. Sally Woods learned from Puaha'aheo, and that genealogy goes back to Kanuku Kapamanu. Then I met, through my life in Hula and all of these beautiful teachers, I met your grandmother, and of course that was uh, Auntie Melia Lobenstein. And Auntie Melia had a really Auntie important. May. She couldn't tell Auntie you. May. No, I'm Melia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me Ulalia. Yeah? Yes. So she had a real big hand in teaching me um, discipline and etiquette, eloquence, focus, 
determination, <laughs> these wonderful things. Yes. Because there is a way, and you have to learn that way of the kumuhula. I followed that way all of my life. I've really never changed the way I speak, the way I present myself, the way I dress, my discipline that becomes my student's discipline came from that time when she would sit in halal with me, you, yeah. and all the students, and guided that process of teaching. Mm -hmm. These kinds of processes that came from the kupuna are processes that perhaps are not being followed today. And because of that, hula is really, really changing from that time. You know, at that time, you you listen, uh, you na na meka maka, you watch with your eyes, ho'opili, meka vavai and meka lima, you follow with your feet and your hands, but you pa'akawaha, you keep your mouth shut, you cannot answer back, you have nothing to say, because if you have something to say, then you're not paying attention. And so, you know, makahana mau no, as you keep doing it, ka ike, the ike comes. Ika ho o ma'ama a mau no, the more you practice, ka ike, the ike comes. And because of all of them, and there are many others, when I was on the big island of Hawaii, I studied uh, for a time with Auntie Edith Kanaka Ole, remarkable, very humble, beautiful, beautiful kumuhula. Um, I was mentored by my grandmother's cousin on the Kukahiva side, that was Auntie um, Kau'i Zudemeister. Um, there are so many of them that became a great part of my life as a kumuhula. And that's kuleana. Today for me, that's big kuleana because I have to maintain and perpetuate all the traditions that they imparted. And because I have such great malama, respect and honor for that time. You know, um, in uh, nine, uh, 2023, I'm going to be um, 69. I'm halfway there already, right? Mm -hmm. And then after that, I'm going to be 70. So all of this training, uh, more than 50 years now have passed. Yet, in my mind, their vision, their words, everything that they taught me is still as vivid as it were yesterday. And I live that way. And that is what gives me not only this great foundation, but the strength to persevere on. Regardless of what's going on around me, that's not my business. My business is what they taught me and how I perpetuate that. What other people do, not my kuleana. A ole pauka ike o kahalau ho kahi. That's their kuleana. If you had a good teacher, you perpetuate what that teacher taught you. For me, I have to perpetuate with that respect and honor, what they taught me. Ay, Polo Lei. Now, you know, you mentioned so many names that I think for a lot of people today, they just are names in books or names that they might have heard in passing. But I think with having you here amongst us, you bring them to life. You give them life because you perpetuate all of the ike that they shared with you. And what I love about it is the pilina, you know, there was no jealousy, there was no, oh, you're a halau hopper. It was because Hula had truly chosen you and the masters that were put into your life were put in your life for a reason and they guided your journey and I believe they still are. And then now that we have you as the Po'e Hula and the Kumu Hula, now we're going to weave into that you as a Hakumele. At what point in your journey 
did you realize that you had this gift? Because that's something we can have a four-hour show about, you being a hapumele. Who was it, do you think, was the influence that said, Koe Kapu, this is your gift? Mm. Well, again, going back to my grandparents who spoke Hawaiian in our home. And that's wonderful. Kavala'o ana amako i loko o kahale o ko umau kupuna. Kavala'o aku ke kahi ke kahi i ka o lelo Hawaii. So, as we spoke Hawaiian in our grandparents' home, they set that foundation for me becoming the hakumele. When my grandmother took me to go and study with Pilahi Paki. Mm. Now, Auntie Pilahi was a teacher for the Ko'olau Poko Hawaiian Civic Club. Back then, in the Hawaiian Civic Clubs, they would bring in these kupuna, these experts, these kumu, to come and teach classes. One of the teachers brought to the Ko'olau Poko Hawaiian Civic Club was um, Pilahi Paki. And I sat in many, many classes with my grandmother and listening to the talks, the lectures, in the Olelo Hawaii by Antipila Hipaki. Of course, it was then and there that I decided I wanted to try and write poetry. Well, several things, several things pushed me to write poetry. Back then, I remember I had written this Mele. And at that time, when I had completed the Mele, I remember I walked into our dining room area and my grandmother was having lunch with several kupuna. And one of them was Auntie Josephine Kiliikipi, which was Auntie Emma's sister. And I came in and I asked them, would they mind? And all the kupuna there, they could olelo Hawaii, would they mind looking at this mele? And everybody looked at the mele. And my grandmother was very unhappy because she felt this was a huge kuleana. And was I ready for this kuleana? Knowing the words, knowing the symbolism of words, knowing how to ho'ohaku haku format the words, knowing and understanding the mana of the words, aya ika olelo keola, aya ika olelo kamake, some words in part life, some words in part death, some words in part a blessing, some words in part a catastrophe. Was I ready for this uh, something that I have to carry on my shoulders all of my life. And so her words, and I understood what my grandmother was saying, it is a huge responsibility. But Auntie Josephine Kelly Ikipi said, when I look at this mele, I'm very, very happy because your life in Hakumele, this kuleana, is going to go is going to be blessed wow it's going to be blessed because as i'm looking at your words the one thing that really touches me is you choose to honor akua you choose to honor kupuna you choose to honor your aina and you choose to honor your family and i had written this in my first mele and she said, because of that, because of what you did, your kuleana going only ulu vehi vehi, ulu mahie hie, ulu maua mau, ulu meka ike ona kupuna. This thing going to grow lush as a plants. This thing going to grow regal and beautiful. This thing going to grow forever. And this ike of the kupuna going to be yours. And then that's when I started. 
from those words of my grandma that were to be cautious and the words from Auntie Josephine Kilikipi about how those words had blessed everything that I was going to do. And it has. I, I, I can write every day. Yes, I know, because I've been with you. And I don't think people realize the extent of your EK and your ability to write. And, you know, we've been sitting in cars and you pull out your phone and you just start singing, singing and you come. But that's the thing. It's like when you are when you are creating your poetry, it's like the air comes with it and you have you just look at something, you look at a lehua, and before you know it, boom, we have five verses ready to go. So if, if I can help others understand and just, what is it? How do you get that? How do you, when do you know that this is the air, this is what goes with this poetry? How do you, it's like, and you create the hula at the same time. Can we just get a little introspect of that? I think it goes back to all the training for from all of these, the people that came into my life that took responsibility. But I really think the Akua and the Aumakua have a greater hand in all of that. That is the inspiration and the intuition. You know, words, melodies, all come together and hula at one time. Right. I don't have to search for anything. In that way, I am blessed because, and, and the littlest thing will inspire it in my processes. It's like being here, but being at a whole different level and dimension. When I hear things, and I do hear them, we call that the ula leo, the spirit voice is singing in your ear. And then I see things, that's the whole ailona, or the vision that we call the akapu. And in that vision, I see the hula, and then I am able to write down the poetry. It happened just the other night when everything was happening. And I remember I was having a very difficult day and I was very, very exhausted. And I had this thought. And the thought was on the story of La Ie Kavai and Aivohi Kupua. And how Aivohi Kupua after he had heard the story from Kawa Kahialii about La Ie Ikavai and how beautiful she was. And he kept having these reoccurring dreams. The dreams kept coming and his desire kept growing to see La Ie Ikavai. At that moment, and I don't know when I started thinking about this, I started to write and hear the, the melody, the music, and the words, and then the hula all at one time. So that kind of kuleana comes from akua and aumakua. But that comes to from living a very disciplined life. Yes. When you live the kind of life you know, I think in our Olelo Hawaii, they call it the iu. So the iu are those people that are chosen for specific purposes in life by the Aumakua. I understand my purpose and I understand the relationship with the Aumakua, but I also understand when I talk about Akua and Aumakua that I have a kuleana to always be my best, do my best, speak my best, reflect my best, which gives them the honor that gives me the inspiration that we share in. Well, I think, yeah, and I think it's such an akumai relationship, your pilina, because everything about you is aloha aku, aloha mai, ike aku, ike mai, because you're so generous. You know, it's not that you write all of these mele and it's like, oh, I can make all of this kala after, on all this on all this music that I'm writing. It's like you literally, I've sat with you. I've been the beneficiary of so many mele. It's like, Toots, do you have a mele about uh, the Miley sisters? It's like, uh, no, but here, give me a couple minutes. And then in like 15 minutes, I have a whole mele. Is, is the, I, I think people need to understand that 
generosity that you have, and that's part of the kuleana. Um, and it also, I think, people need to understand that you do it for your ohanai, for your mo'opuna, and so that they always have that pilina to their mo'olelo and their mo'okuauhau. Could you expound a little bit more on how that happens? So, I remember I was at a performance uh, in Japan, and all these young Hawaiian musicians came. And then when I came into the room, everybody said hello. And one of the young musicians said to me, oh, Kumu, you must be a millionaire. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? Why is that? He said, <clears throat> with all the songs you wrote in your lifetime, and all of these songs being used around the world and being recorded by Hawaiian musicians, wow, you must collect millions of dollars of royalties. So my response was, when you find them, let me know, because I like collect them. <laughs> Truth is, this is Hawaii, and we operate differently in Hawaii. If people pay royalties, good. If they don't pay royalties, well, it's the way it is. <clears throat> the other thought for me is this, though. If the Akua and the Aumakua gave me these things freely, then I cannot, I cannot tell people, give me money. The Akua never asked me for money. True. I never asked the Akua for money. I'm not going to ask those people. But what I, what I would like to see is for them to realize and understand that I have to survive also. I have to make a living. That is the reciprocation. Right. Malama aku, malama mai. Aloha aku, aloha mai. Kokua aku, kokua mai. And that's how it works. When we forget our own traditions, us not minds to go ask for money, because then I feel I insult yes. the aumakua, the akua that gave me this gift. Yes. You know, like when you called and said, oh, can you write a song about sisterhood? I. about women together forming this sisterhood based on love, care, and respect for one another. And immediately my mind went to La Ie Ikavai and the Maile sisters, right? Then I wrote, Hie Hie Lele Hua I Vili Iame Kamaile Eku Ui Pohoheno, he hoa pilino mine. And I thought about Laie Kavai and about the time when Aivohiku Pua abandoned his sisters because they had failed in securing Laie Ikavai as a wife for him. He had sent uh, the Maile Haivale. He had sent the Maile Kaluhea. He had sent the Maile Laulii. He had sent the Maile Pakaha. The four Maile sisters to release their beautiful, sweet perfume of Maile to entice La Ie Ikavai to come out, to be with him so that he could secure her as a wife. And finally, when the four sisters failed, he decided to leave not really giving Kahala Omapuana a chance, but it was Kahala Omapuana that secured the friendship of La Ie Ikavai, now joining all of the Maile sisters in this bond, because the outcome of that story is that the Maile sisters became, in a sense, the doorway to the home of La Ie Ikavai after that. So their bond of friendship lasted for a long time. And where does that inspiration come from? It comes from the Akua. Yeah. I always remember Grandma saying, you know, if you malama the gifts that are given to you, then the faucet will stay turned on. The minute you start to abuse it, then they turn it off. And I believe that that's what's, it's been a blessing. And kind of what Auntie had said to you at the table at your first mele is that everything it just, this whole ulu vehi vehi, and your journey has certainly been blessed. Um, but I think 
what's even more important in that vision that she had seen is that you have been a blessing to everyone else. Um, and that we, the Lahui, and everyone who loves Hawaiian music, who love hula, who love mo'olelo, we're able to have pilina to these stories, to these akua, to these aumakua, and to keakua through the things that you write and you share with us. And I just think that that is just so amazing. I also have to uh, mention um, Auntie Alice na Makelua because Auntie Alice was the one that urged me, in a sense, to perform my own mele. Mm. You know, when we performed back then, um, you know, Auntie Alice na Makelua came to all the performances. And of course, they come to listen, they come to observe Ike, they come to witness Ike, and they come to share Ike wisdom and knowledge. Back then, when the kupuna came, because of the way we were raised, we never answered back when they criticized us. That was their kuleana. Right. As they criticized what we did, they were guiding us to do the things that were pono and polole within our culture. And they, of course, had the ike, the knowledge, and the years of dedication and skill to be the ones. You see, that tradition we call ho'oke. Mm -hmm. Ho'oke is when they come, and they come specifically to do all of that. And when they come, you cannot be scared or you cannot act sassy or you cannot act like you're above everybody. What you have to do is be humble. In fact, I learned from the kupuna, you invite them to come so that they can criticize you. And from the criticism, constructive criticism, you learn to better yourself. This is the way I learned my hula. You know, I kept having these ho'ike every year, and I would invite all these kumuhula to come. And I remember one of the students of one of the kumuhula said to me, you know, Kavai Kapu, my teacher doesn't like you at all. Why do you keep inviting my teacher to your performances? And my reply was, I have to. Mm -hmm. Because it's about my respect for them and me following the traditions that was taught to me. So that they go and ho'oke, criticize me, good or bad, that's okay. I will learn from that process. Now, Auntie Alice na Makelua would come, and oh my God, she poke you with that cane, and then she tell you. Well, I think a lot of people got angry. I never got angry. It is what it is. I would learn from every situation. When she tell you, you're singing the song wrong, you singing the song wrong. When she tell you you dancing the hula wrong, then you dancing the hula wrong. That's not my kuleana to ho'okano, ho'oyo, you know, talk sassy right. yeah, to these people. No, because they are elders. Yeah. They are kupuna. I just put my head down and I listen. But what I do is kawai kapo o kaladi. So after being criticized for the things I was doing, I devised a plan. And that plan was, I'm going, from now on, only dance my music <laughs> and my songs, because then nobody can criticize, because I did it. Right. I wrote it, I choreographed it, I costumed it, I did the ulu vehi vehi of everything. So you know what? Now, mahalo. Mahalo kupuna, mahalo Auntie Alice, Auntie Alice the Makelua, because you taught me a great lesson. I'm going to take that lesson, and I'm going to build on that lesson. That's right. And that is what happened after that. And one of the first songs I went to perform in public was, Ke'i hola kaua, hali hali na lehua, Oluna. And this is how I began that journey. So the teachers that came into my life came for many reasons, reflected many things, and guided me in many, many different ways. And in that way, Auntie Alice Namakelua, 
uh, did that for me, and I appreciate that. I always remember her, and I always remember that story. Well, that's why, too, your grandma would always say, when they do things like that, it's prove me wrong. They're challenging you to find your better self, right? It's not just to criticize, it's for you to do something. So look how lucky we are that Auntie Alice took that road. But speaking of Auntie Alice, I want to talk about another wonderful, I know she's a huge influence in your life, and I don't think people, or a lot of people, understand the pilina you had with Auntie Genoa Keabe and yes. her influence on you. So <clears throat> Auntie Genoa uh, had taken hula, from Sam Puahaheo, and Auntie Genoa um, was influential in my life because of that, because of her knowledge of hula, because of her knowledge of mele, because of her knowledge of olelo Hawaii. Auntie's family comes from Ni'ihau. Now, her hula comes from Puaha'aheo and Puaha'aheo's genealogy connects to Kanuku Kapamanu. Many people on the windward side of the island of Oahu connect to that Kapamanu genealogy of Hula. Now, I traveled with Auntie Genoa many places in the world and always had to, had to deal with the criticism and being corrected and being put in my place. Auntie Genoa, being a good kumuhula, or a good exponent of hula, as well as mele and olelo, would watch my performance very keenly, and then after the show, make those corrections that I had to do, and I followed them. Auntie Genoa was my second mom. I know she was my number one mom on the stage, making sure dress properly, adorn yourself properly, do your motions properly, do your steps properly. And every time I dance, if you watch the old video, she go, oh, you show off. Because that showing off was reflective of that training from Auntie Genoa Keave. So great person. I remember once we were in Japan and we were practicing for a concert and Auntie Genoa was on the stage and she was singing and you know all these different groups would come up and they would um, perform their hula but there was some challenges because all of the kumu hula in Japan wanted Auntie to play the music like the CD mm. And they were having a hard time adjusting to the live performance. And so I know Auntie was getting frustrated on stage. And uh, the next thing I remember on the microphone, she yelled out my name and she said, where's Kavai Kapu? You tell Kavai Kapu, come to the stage right now. And so I walked on the stage and she said, you, get in the front there. And so I stood at the, the middle of the stage front and then she started to play, and she said, you, you dance. And she played like 10 songs. And I had to dance all 10 songs. In whatever way she played the song, I had to dance those songs. She went from Ia Li'i to Lei Nani to uh, Nani to Ulu Vehi Vehi Oe Ika U Ikila, the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, and one after the other, I had to dance those songs. And then when I was done, huffing and puffing on the stage. She told all the Japanese people, you see him? You see how he danced the hula? When I play the music for you, you dance this song how I play the music. You do not walk on this stage and you don't tell me how to play my music. <laughs> and, and, and that was the way. That was my kuleana with Auntie Genoa as we performed uh, around the world all the way to Siberia, throughout Europe and uh, Asia, and throughout Hawaii, wherever we went. That was strict, but I had been trained by really good people, so I know how to behave and act appropriately to elders, to kupuna, right. and well, never question 
their authority and their Never direction. Question. Well, and I think that that's, that's probably why you and I travel so well together. It's because we were brought up by the same kind of kumuhula. Um, and that's one thing I always know about you is that when we go and we travel, it's work first. You know, we're always on point. We are never late. We're always ready. We're makauko. Um, and when the show is po, we eat and we go back to our room and it's po. There's no tomfoolery around just because that's the way our kupuna raised us to always have that respect and that dignity. Yeah. We're always the first ones there. Yes. <laughs> and we're always the last to leave because we got to clean up. We got to clean up. Yes. We don't leave one leaf. We don't leave one mile leaf on the floor. No. We got to clean up. Yes. We make sure we're there first. We set everything and then we clean up. And when the show power, we don't get to go out. No. We do not get to go out. Go home. You go home. Yeah. You do not carouse. You do not go out drinking. You take your okole and you go home. Yes. And I will call and check if you stay home. Yes. I think the, maybe Japan has influenced Hawaiian entertainers in many different ways because as soon as they perform, the first thing they think, they're going to out drink. Not us. We never, we couldn't think like that. You're going home. You was lucky if they take you to Like Like Drive-In to eat a cheeseburger <laughs> and a strawberry shake and then take your okole home after that. Right. But you could not carouse with the musicians. Hula was strict for us. You pow your performance. You take all your ukana. You go home. That was the way it was done. But you make sure, yeah, you know, you don't leave your place kapulu. That's right. If you leave your place kapulu, that's a reflection on That's right. Auntie Genoa. That's a reflection of me and all of my teachers. I cannot kapulu anything. I cannot kapulu the way I talk. I cannot kapulu the way I dress. I cannot kapulu my, manner, my mannerisms, my performance, none of that. Everything has to be in alignment with all of that teaching. And you know people who had that kind of good teaching because we are the way we are yes. because of that. Yes. Now, I'm going to transition a little bit because talking about keeping everything clean and, and just the discipline and the focus that you have. Let's talk a little bit about how you moved into the realm because you're also known as a spiritual healer. Like you are a proponent of Ho'oponopono. You know how to handle these things within the family and the greater Ohana. Many people look to you for guidance. And so it's not just about the hula and the music. All of that ike kupuna that you were given is wound up into you also as a spiritual guide. Can you talk a little bit about that? So all of that came from all the kumuhula. There is a very close connection between hula and ho'ola. Ho'ola is the healing tradition. Hula is a dance tradition. The akua and the aumakua of hula are the same akua and aumakua of ho'ola, which is healing. When you go into the forest to pick the plants to make your lei, those are the same akua you entreat in pule or prayer when you go to pick your medicinal herbs. The, the papa, the ranking, the format, the podo, it's all really, really the same. The akua at the top, followed by the aumakua, followed by the aina, and then the people. Everything connected in both traditions, hula and ho'ola, because of the teachers and the knowledge they, they held. Because, you know, the kumuhula, they were the they were the holders of all the knowledge because they had to deal with all of the students. We, they had to be the, the doctor, the nurse, the psychologist, the psychiatrist. They had to be the mentor. They had to be the teacher. They had to be everything for everyone. The healer. Well, you entreat the same akua into the tradition of the hula the ho'oponopono, because you have to po ho'oponopono the halau. The ho'ola, because you have to ho'ola the halau. 
the lomi lomi because you have to teach them about the bones, about the muscles, how to treat them. Then there is the oli in the hula, we call the pule, the kahea in the whole ola. Very, very similar. And as you learn more, you strengthen your abilities in these traditions. Strengthening the abilities is not enough though. You have to maintain the abilities through your work that brings honor and respect to the akua and the aumakua. Remember now, the aumakua in their realm are also the, or also have the kuleana of punishing their descendants, punishing. They give wisdom, they give inspiration, they give help, they give guidance, they give support. If we give them respect and honor in all that we do and all that we say, all that we are, but the minute we stop and we become disrespectful, then those very same kupuna ancestors that give us all that goodness are the same ones that punish. So because of my understanding through pono and ho'opono pono of all of these things, then it was only natural to transcend into that area. Because if I am going to perpetuate the strength of the ike of all of these things, then I have to live that very disciplined life. Because the goal then is to stay connected. The goal is to be one with Akua and Aumakua. In the spiritual plane, yeah? the spiritual plane, the physical plane, that's where all the Kanaka are. So we deal with Kanaka emotions and Kanaka things, but we want to be Pilipa'a, firmly connected to the spiritual plane of our akua and our aumakua. And for me, that's where the spirituality comes in. The knowing, the understanding, the ike kupuna, but also the training, which is ike kupuna again. Without the ike kupuna, would I have uh, acquired all of this ike? And no. The growth process with the kupuna was that moment, that acquiring, that time, learning, absorbing, and then becoming the mentor. Now at a different time to the people that want to learn. And so with that, I think another facet about you that um, always um, not amazes me because I guess I've seen it all my life um, is you as a kia'i aina. And I think it all, it all connects. Certainly now you're, it seems like you're more vocal only because of social media and, and um, just the technology that we have. But you have been a fighter and a protector of our aina for a long time. And a lot of it goes back to Kaho Olave, to Auntie Emma, and even before that. Could you share a little bit about those experiences with us? Well, Aloha Aina has always been a great part of my life. Because of hula, you pick your maile, you pick your lehua, you pick your lawae. But also coming from a family of mahi aikalo, you learn about maia, uwala, ulu, sustainability, and natural resources. Being groomed for all of that as a child growing up in the home of my grandparents, it was very natural when the time came to move with Auntie Emma into Protect Kaho Olave. In Protect Kaho Olave and Aloha Aina, everyone has their place, our place to support the struggle, the endeavors, and the movement was music and hula, because that is what I was trained to do. So performing with Olomana was one way that we could help at all the fundraisers, but 
I also went to Kaho'olawe with Auntie Emma to perform the ceremony and the rituals. And uh, that was an amazing time. That was an amazing learning time for me, uh, being taken to the island and how to prepare the hali'i, the platform, how to prepare the ahu, how to prepare the different pu'olo, how to present or prepare the different ho'okupu, because that became my job. So before we went to Kaho'olawe, specifically I was given tasks by Auntie Emma. This is what I want you to do. You, had, you have to gather so many types of these different ho'okupu. The number was important. Then you had to wrap them a certain way. So the preparation was important. Then when we get there, how you lay them out, where you lay them out, in what format you lay them out, that was also important. So how to do all of this while in training was a great part of my memory and how I know and understand the symbolism today, the symbolism of the ho'okupu, the symbolism of the number of the ho'okupu to be presented, the symbolism of how they were wrapped with what leaves they were wrapped in, the symbolism of the leaves to make the hali'i, and then the symbolism of how many of each ho'okupu and their representations to the akua and the aumakua were presented there. So today it's different. I don't understand what they're doing today. But that's not to say anything other than I have to understand what my teacher taught me. The magic in the understanding and being able to interpret the number sequence, the shape sequence, the plant sequence, the foundation of it all that came from anti Emma D. Freeze is what I continue to follow today and maybe one day when the time is right I can teach that or mentor someone because that's very very important why you do two why you do four why you do six why you do eight why one why three why five why seven and what these numbers represent and why is it a square why is it a circle why is it a rectangle and what does that represent yeah yeah, everything I had to learn. Um, it was an amazing time. And even that transcends into hula and healing, ho'ola for me today. Because I have to operate on the same <clears throat> direction that they gave me back then. I think that's beautiful. Yeah, mahalo for sharing that. Um, if you had to pick one mele, that you have written as like the epitome uh, to date of your inspiration, what would that mele be? I think, I think I'm gonna go with the first mele and that was Kavai Lehua A'ala Kahunua. Um, this mele has so many, many reflections. One of the names of La Ie Kavai is Kavai Aala Lehua. <clears throat> Kavai Lehua Aala Kahonua is a play on that name of La Ie Kavai, Kavai Aala Lehua. But Kavai Lehua Aala Kahonua comes from the story that Auntie Emma shared with me one day of how <clears throat> the heavens and the earth were separated in the very ancient time, the ki nohi nohi, the lipo lipo, the pano pano, where things happen that are unexplainable today. And the heavens were lifted up and the earth stayed below. And there was this great space in between Vakia and Papa. And Papa tried to reach up to grab onto Vakia and Vakea tried to reach down and to hold on to Papa. But during this time of separation, they were so far apart that it was impossible. 
and how were the two going to connect Sky Father, Earth Mother, Vakya and Papa. And Vakya, in his deep emotion, his love for Papa, began to weep. And his tears fell to the earth as rain. The rain penetrated the earth, that is Papa. And in that way, he could touch her through his tears once again. In reflection of that love through the tears of Vakya, as the rain penetrated the earth, Papa sent forth from her body the ohia. And from the very tips of the ohia burst forth these red blossoms, the lehua. And the red blossoms were reflective of her emotion and her love to Vakea. And if you look at the lehua blossoms, they always face up. Blossoms don't bloom this way. They always face up to the Sky Father so that she could embrace him with these beautiful red blossoms that when he looked down, he could see the love of his beloved Papa. So that's one story of how this song was created. The other speaks of the very conception of life within the womb of a mother so that the water creates life like the tears penetrating the earth when Vakea, the sky father and papa the earth mother come together is really no different than when a man and a woman comes together that through the exchange of the vaiha, the water that has life, that a child is conceived within the womb. Now, as the child is in the womb and it is growing, it is within its own life force, the amniotic fluid, the water again, that is nurturing the life of that child in the womb. Well, before the child is born, the water breaks and the water has another significant role in birth and the water signals the hanau, the birth of that child. Well, after the child is born, the child needs to be nourished and the ch child nurses on its mother and that's the vai, that's the vayu, the milk that will nurture the growth of that child. So Kavai Lehua, the Lehua was the child. The child from the very coming together of the mother and father to the conception, to the nurturing, to the growing, to the birth, to being nurtured at the mother's breast. This is another reflection of Kavai Lehua Ala Kahonua. So when I write, you know, people say, oh, <clears throat> your words are so simple. <laughs> well, I learned to choose words that have 10 or more meanings mm -hmm. that would have allusions flying everywhere in its interpretation. To use those words very wisely, to use them with intent, with purpose, so Kavai Lehua was written, and only until I share the story and every aspect and how every word was woven into that lay of olelo, lay of words, then you get some kind of insight <clears throat> on how that was written and what those reflections are and how I'm able to bring into this format, this order, yeah the different manao or the different reflections, yeah?
That Kauai is Lehua is one of the one of the greatest ones. Uh, yeah, I would say so too, and that <coughs> is just amazing. I, and and yes, the words are simple, but I always remember Grandma saying that there is beauty in simplicity. And when we hear the olelo of our kupuna, they didn't talk in highfalutin language. They talked, and it was always with intent. And they did. They chose their words very carefully, um, and with purpose. And I think for most of us in hula, if we had to pick maybe our favorite Koei Kapuo Kalani song, that would probably be at the top because I think we discussed this. How many times has that been recorded worldwide? Um, 65 times. Kugli I think 65, maybe more times it's been recorded around the world by people in several countries as well as in Hawaii. Wow. <laughs> And then when you look at that, I believe that there were other melee that were <coughs> like the sequel. Could you tell us a little about the melee that you've cre that you've written that kind of had Pilina literally to that melee and told the story further of La Ie Kawai? I think uh, the next melee that I like to re reflect on is Poliahu. <clears throat> and you know this uh, this love for Akua and Aumakua goes back to Mo'okuauhau genealogy. And my focus when I write is family. And when I write, <clears throat> I have to start with my immediate family. <clears throat> and then I have to build into the many, many generations that we're connected to. So... <clears throat> Before I get into that, I need to drink some water. Okay. <laughs> so when you talk about Poliahu, when you talk about Laie Kavai, when you talk about all of these Akua, all of these Kupua, if I'm not connected to them, either through Mo'o'olelo or Mo'o'kuauhau, that's not my Kuleana. Kuleana is he ivi, he ivi, he io, he io, he koko, he koko. To be or to have that connection of flesh, bones, and blood. So before I write about anyone or anything, I have to have that connection to mo'okuauhau and mo'o'olelo. So I've studied extensively all of these genealogies. And... Uh, when it came to Poliahu and writing this mele, there is a story about writing it specifically for someone who was going through the similar story of Poliahu in real life. I took that story and overlapped the Poliahu Poli story over what was happening in real life. So in the story, Aivohi Kupua leaves Poliahu to journey back to his home on Kauai. Poliahu agrees to the journey because he tells her he's going to return. What happens is he stops on Maui, and in Hana, he has to fulfill a promise he had made previously to Hina Ikamalama to marry her. Now, Poliahu, having this psychic intuition, knows what's going on, and it breaks her heart. So, the night that Aivohi Kupua and Hina Ikamalama uh, should be consummating their marriage, Poliahu and her sisters come to their dwelling. That is Lilinoi, that is Waiau, that is Kahopokane. They all come. And as the couple try to move together, They cannot, because the goddesses send 
fire. Don't forget, they are sisters of Pele. So when they split apart, Kupua and Hina Ikamalama, they send the cold, the icy cold, and they try to come back together, but the warmth creates fire and they have to split. So this happens throughout the night, so they're never able to, to do that. Aivohi Kupua and Hina Ikamalama. And again, they, they know eventually that Poliahu and her sisters are there. But the story is about Poliahu coming to a place of forgiveness and understanding and acknowledgement of herself, her abilities, her qualities, her beauties. Vai maka o Poliahu ika eha ake aloha, kaumaha ika haalele o aivohi kupua. So she's grieving, crying, because Aivohi Kupua has left her. And it says, Eho imai e ku ipo, come back to me, come back to me. Anu anu ka iu ke hau o mauna kea, a ohe ana ipo aloha e ho opumehana. So where she dwells at the top of mauna kea is so very, very cold, and she has nobody to keep her warm. He's gone. So she calls again, Eho imai e ku uipo. Then, Kau mai kahali aloha o ka mua, Pū olono ka vai maka i ku umehameha. So these memories, these beloved memories, these thoughts, these remembrances come to her as she is alone and it brings tears to her eyes. And she calls out, Eho imai e kuuipo. Then finally, in the last verse, it says, Hele ko aloha no kuukino, pili poli hemo ole no nakawakau, that your lei shall always be, that your love shall always be a lei that I will wear close to my heart, and it should never, it will never be removed. And, and, and this is how the mele ends, where she realizes that love is forever, and I will always have this love that I had for you, and life goes on, and I, with my life, like you with yours, we cannot control destiny. Destiny belongs to the Akua. Well, that song is really about the birth of Kamehameha I, when Kamehameha Paiea is born, his mother, Kekuiapo Eva, has to give him up in Hanai, and that is when uh, Kahopulani and that family take the infant Kamehameha, and they take him and they raise him. Regardless of knowing the tradition, any mother would grieve knowing that they had to give their child up to be raised by someone else and to acknowledge that I will never be able to hold, nurse, carry, and love that child because she did not see him again until he was a young man. Well, that burden of tradition following the tradition of our kupuna and following the pono, knowing that, she said, from this day forward, I will live my life like the goddess Poliahu, never being able to embrace my own son. And that is a story of Poliahu, you see? the song Poliahu. At that time, I was hanaiing my own first son. And the understanding of what Kamehameha's mother went through, what Poliahu went through, and now this mother that was giving me her child was going through. The gift of life, the gift of love, the gift of happiness, through the mele poliahu. 
So Poliahu is crying in the mele. Kekuiapo Iva is crying in the mele. The mother of my son is crying in the mele. And I'm crying in this mele. But it's not a mele of sadness. It's a mele of happiness. And you see that in the outcome of the mele and in the outcome of the many, many stories. So when you sing, Vai maka o poli ahu, ika eha ake aloha. And it all comes to fruition when you understand the depth of the word, that everything was being held in the heart in the caress of each and every emotion that was being felt by all of these people. That's the poliahu of the mele. That's just amazing. And it's, you know, every time I hear you talk about one of your mele, it's I learn something more. And I think that is such a gift. That is definitely a gift that you have been blessed with and that all of us um, who are fortunate enough to, to get a glimpse into your, your mind and your heart and your spirit um, understand about that pilina and that we're all woven together in this. And it's just amazing. So going a little further now, as a Hakumele, you are going to be honored this year as in the Hawaii, Hawaii Music, Music Hall, Hall of, of Fame. Fame. So tell us a little bit about that and, and how does that make you feel? What does that mean for you? Uh, I think it's very nice. I appreciate uh, being inducted into the Hawaii Music Hall of Fame. I think um, it's a great honor. I think it's a tribute to everything that I've accomplished thus far, but it doesn't mean I'm going to stop. Right. That just means now I have more kuleana, more responsibility, uh, more mele to write, more hula to choreograph, more shows to do. Um, yeah, you just keep on going. That's life, right? That's our hula life. You know, what's that saying? The show must go on. And even when people think the show cannot go on, the show must go on. I remember hearing that from the kupuna so many times. Hey, don't worry about that. The show must go on. And there we are on that stage. Say one musician no show up, the show must go on. The hula dancers no show up, the show must go on. The sound system not working, the show must go on. No more stage lights, let's perform in the dark. I remember at one Kaho Olave concert, they would shut all the electricity and everybody would move their cars in position and shine the car lights on the stage. The show must go on. And that's the way it is. We continue. Yeah? Nobody stops. You know, that's vision. Yeah? You have to have that vision. And then you have to have that guidance and you have to have that inspiration. And then I go back again to Akua and then to the Aumakua, to the Kupuna, to our Aina. Hawaii is such a very special place. Yeah? Once you step on the Aina, it inspires you. Yeah? It touches you in so many, many ways. And then as Kanaka, how we treat one another. Yeah? When you raise the right way, you treat people the right way. Yeah? When you raise with Aloha, you interact with Aloha. You interact with the Aloha that comes from Akua. You interact with the Aloha that comes from Aina. You interact with the Aloha, the Aloha that comes from your Kupuna, your Makua, that you share with one another. And I think for me, that is what drives everything I do, is the Aloha, the Aloha of our Hawaii Inhe. That's beautiful. When I think, you know, for you getting an award like this, it really is, um, as you accept your award and, and, and listen to all the accolades, I think, or I know, that for you, your kupuna are with you. That's their award as well, because they are the ones that inspired you and, and set you on this path. And that's a beautiful way to honor them. I think also, too, it's also the people that I've been on stage with, mm -hmm. you know, from Charles K.L. Davis, Kai Davis, 
Ed Kenny, Beverly Noah, the Maka Sons of Niihau, the Peter Moon Band, Olomana, and Ti Genoa Keave, and Ti Violet Pahulili Koi, um, there's so many, I mean, from back then, if you can imagine, I mean, how many people can say they were on stage with all these great people? I danced Hi'ilave with uh, uh, Gabby Pahinui on the back of a flatbed truck. I danced for Cyril, I danced for Blah, I danced for Martin, um, performing at Kemo'o Farms. Uh, Johnny K. Alameda was there. Um, all of these great people in Hawaiian entertainment, it, it, it was just remarkable. And still performing with many, many people today. And Timomi Ka Hawaii Ola'a. What a allay of remarkable people and entertainers in this life. And, you know, they're all a part of, of making this happen. You know, all the kumuhula, um, you know, Auntie May and Auntie Lani and Auntie Emma and Auntie Josephine and my grandma and Auntie Sally Woods. Um, you know, I remember when I used to go down to the Polynesian Cultural Center to church college and I would sit in the rehearsals that Auntie Sally was conducting and my grandma and grandpa were a part of it. And of course, you know, going to the church and sitting through hours of rehearsals for performances and then going into the school, the college cafeteria. All I remember was eating sundaes, chocolate sundaes. You could make your own ice cream and put your own chocolate. Yeah, those things happen. We're talking about what, 1961, 1962, maybe farther back than that, that I was involved in all of that, performing with Loyal Gardner on the stage. Of course, Melvin is still performing, but performing with Melvin Lead, performing with so many, many fabulous entertainers, doing shows with them, dancing the hula, singing with them. I remember Palani Vaughn, we did concerts at... Uh, so many places and traveled so many places. I remember we had gone to Kauai with Palani Vaughn and I forget what hotel, and they had a very low roof above the stage and they had a luau in the same room uh, nightly and then they had a fire knife dancer. Didn't realize that the whole rooftop was covered in black soot. Oh my. And you know, I'm like almost six feet three, dancing all night on the stage, and my hand kept hitting the roof, and my fingers were all black. And everybody was like, what's going on with your hands? I was like, oh my God, it's the roof. Um, yeah, I remember that. I remember performing with Plani Vaughn at the concert hall, and uh, he told me, okay, brother, he always called me brother, we're gonna have the stage down, and uh, you're gonna be behind the stage, and then the script going to start, and they're going to read uh, the chant Kamomi by Kala Kawa's, his travels and his journeys. And soon as the curtain goes up, we'll start playing the music and you start dancing. So, okay, I'm standing there. And the reading of the poem starts. It's all on a cassette tape. And immediately, as soon as it starts, the curtain goes up. And that wasn't supposed to happen. I'm standing there by myself, and I'm, and I'm like, oh, what the hell am I going to do now, right? So they start singing, I have traveled over distant lands and many seas. And, you know, being the entertainer, I have traveled over <laughs> different lands and many seas. And I went dance that whole poem, and I was like, oh, my God. And then they came on stage, and then I started dancing Hi'ilave. And I thought to myself, oh my God, after the show, Polani said, oh, you ain't saved this whole show. They were not supposed to do that. I said, don't worry about it. That's, that's what being an entertainer right, is all about. Right, that's it. I can hear Grandma saying, look smart, look right. smart. Don't just stand there <laughs> and not do nothing. Don't just stand there and ho ah, ah, right. look smart. <laughs> and there are many times 
in my performance life. I remember I fell off the stage at uh, the shell. Oh. I fell off the stage at the shell. That was so hilarious. I would jump back up like one of the kind gymnasts, get back on the stage and finish the song. Oh my goodness. You gotta do what you, you gotta, gotta do, do on the stage. You gotta do what you have to do. Yeah. Wow. Wait. But you know, I wanna say one thing about the Ole Lo Hawaii. Okay. You know, Nokawahano oko umauku puna ke ia olelo. Ko o olelo Hawaii. Nalako kahanai mayana iau meka olelo. Oyo no ke kumu oko u alohanui no ka olelo Hawaii. No na mele Hawaii. No ka hakua no na mele. Amena hula. Puli kino ko umau kupu na ia umeka olelo. There was one time in my life I didn't want to speak olelo Hawaii. That was my choice. And that was because I went to perform at a concert way back then. And when I went up to the stage, I got onto the mic, we're doing hula kahiko. And I greeted everybody. Aloha mai kako, o wau no o kumu kawai kapo o kalani ke ia manawa e ho o vehe ana au ya o kou ka manao e pili ana no ke ia mau hula a mako no ka ho i ke ako aino ya ya o kou. And the audience started laughing. And people don't know this. There was a time where people didn't appreciate the Olelo Hawaii. Our own people didn't appreciate the Olelo Hawaii. And at the show, it was like I was telling a joke and everybody was laughing. And that impacted me so hard that not until just a couple years ago, you know, I would start again, continue, because that impacted me so greatly that although I continued to write publicly, I wouldn't. I never wanted to do that. But during this time of COVID, right after um, I came down from uh, Mauna Kea at that time, I made a decision and I said that nobody going to take away my voice again. So when I vehe kamanao o kela mele kela mele ke ia mele a kela mo olelo ke ia mo olelo kela mo oku au hau ke ia mo oku au hau pili ke ia mele. Then I'm going to explain it in the Olelo Hawaii. And I took that power back and that voice back that was mine, that came from my kupuna back in 1954 when they first nurtured me in the Olelo Hawaii. And because of them, the kumu, they are the foundation of everything that I have become, everything that I am, I have to acknowledge that, them, their role and responsibility in making Kavai Kapu Okalani Hewitt, Kavai Kapu Okalani Hewitt. Oh, you know, my Kai. Now, what, now that you are in the realm of kupuna, mm. yeah, you are a kupuna that is valued in our, in our lahui. What message do you feel you would want to impart on younger kumu, whether uh, kumu hula, kumu kula, kumu ike Hawaii, uh, hakumele? What is it that you have learned? and feel like it's the greatest little morsel of ike kupuna you could impart on those coming up in the ranks. I think he vai vai nui ka ike ona kupuna. The greatest value we have today is the knowledge, the wisdom of our kupuna. I took it upon myself because I realized that value, to take the time to study, to learn, to be with, to embrace, to honor kupuna. I did that. When I could have went to college 
and got a doctorate, I turned that whole intent around to being with kupuna, knowledgeable kupuna, kupuna who embraced me, kupuna who wanted to share their knowledge so that those ike would continue to live on. Today, I think we like to use the word kupuna when it fits the moment, but yet we don't really value kupuna like we should value kupuna and the ike kupuna. When you learn from kupuna, you are fulfilling the pono of a Hawaii. When you go to the Western school, then you are learning through the Western way so that you can receive a degree that says you went to a Western school and now the Western school will acknowledge you for your accomplishments. That's not bad if you acknowledge what you're doing. Because sometimes in this Western world, we need the degrees to help us to get to where we'd like to go. If I didn't get a BA, I would not be a teacher here. But once I got my BA and I was able to acknowledge this is where I wanted to be, then the next place I moved was with Kupuna. Because for me, that's the education that I value. The ho'olohe, the listening. The na na mekamaka, the watching intently. The ho'opili, the following. These things were so important to me. Ike aku ike mai. The knowledges that they shared with me are the knowledges I share today. But as you heard me speak today, I mentioned all of their names or as many of their names as I could remember because I don't want them to be forgotten. I want them to be here with me now and forever, wherever I go, because they are the guides, the foundation, and the strength. Today, everybody likes to learn things from the kupuna, but immediately they want to write it on some paper or they want to blast it on some social media so that they get the recognition of what the kupuna gave to them without recognizing the name of that kupuna. So as you're in college and you're getting all the knowledge from the kupuna and you're writing your doctorate, that intent is that once that's done, in the future, you become the reference point or the reference person for that knowledge when our culture says, ike aku ike mai, that you have to acknowledge the bearer of that wisdom and knowledge, which was the kupuna. Ike aku ike mai, honor them, recognize them, give them their proper place in this ike. You have to do it on your term paper. It's called footnotes. You can do it there, but in real life, as Lahui Hawaii, we tend to forget that. So we hear something from a kupuna, and boom, now they're the bearer of that ike. No, send them to that kupuna. That's what we're supposed to do. Send them to that kupuna. That kupuna has purpose, place in life. But when you take that away, you take away the place of the kupuna in our culture. You have just taken away the place, the proper place, the pono of our kupuna in our culture. You see, that's really, really important that we understand the pono. The akua is always first. The kupuna and the aumakua, they're right after the akua. How can we honor anything, keiki, opio, and makua, if we never follow the order, the order says akua first, 
then the kupuna. And because the kupuna is right after the akua and the aumakua, they're the living representatives. And we dishonor them by taking their ike and not honoring them for their ike. And we do that time and time again because everybody like be the king or queen of all the ike of Hawaii. Ne. <laughs> I think that is very important. And I, you know, you're one of the first ones, I think, that um, maybe it was pre pandemic, but you've always talked about the importance of haloa and our pili to haloa. And then explaining in a very understandable and respectful way the difference between being haloa and haole. And um, I'm hearing it being used more and more, and I'm like, wait, but Kwai Kapu was the first one. Be your haloa. Right. No to need be, be ha ole. To be ha Haloa, ole. long breath, ha ole, not having the breath, the knowledge of your culture. Be your haloa. No need be your ha ole, be your haloa. That for me was being connected to the ancient Mo'okuo right. Hau that took us back to Papa and Vakea, their daughter Ho'ohoku Kalani and her children, Haloa Ke Kalo and Haloa Ke Kanaka. That all the way back there, we are all connected. Pili no kako ke kahi ke kahi. Don't separate. Don't mahelehele with attitude. Don't mahelehele. Don't mahelehele with Facebook, social media. But always think about how we can come together. Ohana, ke kahi, ke kahi. Be your haloa. Don't need be your haole. We don't need be haole. Be haloa. Well, are there any other closing thoughts you want to share about any part of your life? Because you have so many hats that you wear and so many titles that you carry. You know, for us, it's we just call you Tutu Man at this point. Um, and I know that's one of your favorite roles as well. And I know that everything you do is for your mo'opuna and for your ohana. And so any last thoughts that you want to share with us about I think that? I do what I do because it's important for me to teach and to share. It's important for me to embrace. E ohana kako ika olelo. Let's be one family in our language. Puli ke kako ke kahi ke kahi me ka olelo. And hug one another with the olelo. And let's perpetuate the Olelo Hawaii. Everything for me began with hard work. Hard work as I was raised by my kupuna. You know, I remember, yeah, we sitting at this beautiful lauhala mat and all these plants. From a young child, every weekend, we have to hapai, carry all the plants outside of the house. Because grandma's house had a core wood floor we had to, every weekend, hapai all the plants outside and water them all. Then we take all the lauhala mats outside and we wipe them all down outside on the front lawn. And then we clean all the core floor. We take all the furniture out. Then by midday, we take all the lauhala mat inside. We take all the furniture back inside and then we carry all the plants. That was every Saturday. Hard work we would learn from a long time ago. And you no can achieve nothing without hard work. Grandma said, you like something? Work for it. You like wear nice clothes? Learn how to sew. You like eat good food? Learn how to cook. You like have clean house? Learn how to clean the house now. I will learn. And from that foundation of learning with my kupuna, I still doing the same thing. I value, I truly value ka ike a me ka no eau o na po e kupuna o Hawaii inei. E ola mau ka ike o na kupuna. Let the knowledges of our kupuna be perpetuated. E ola mauno ka ike o na kupuna me mako na moopuna. And let all these knowledges 
live on with us, the grandchildren, the descendants. Ika oya iho in truth. Ho'olohe, listen. Na na, watch. Ho'opili, follow. Ah, ho'aono, and then you become enlightened. Yeah? yeah, that's the way to do it. But I think uh, we're going to ask you for doing hula. Oh, okay. I think we're going to do uh, kavaile hua a alaka Oh, nice. And uh, mahalo everyone. Mahalo for nui. being here today. Um, it's been a pleasure. Again, what I'd like to do is mahalo our staff, our administration here at Winnet Community College. Again, to mahalo one of our main sponsors, amongst the many, um, the Dolores Mar Martin Foundation. And of course, mahalo our kumuhula uh, Melia Lobenstein Carter for being here with us oh, today. Oh, this has been such a pleasure. And doing this, I'm the lucky uh, one. I've been blessed. Mahalo. But you know, this is just three hours of interview. There's hundreds of hours more. I know. <laughs> so until the next session, the next time we film Ke Ao Okama Lama Lama Okahula, I would like to say Mahalo to everyone. Mahalo Kako. Na kea kua no kahopo mai kai. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Oh, uh -huh.